Good afternoon. With the Labor Day weekend now having come to a close, with the traffic in Bethesda having reached its uh, seasonal delightful state, uh, with little kids having gone off to school, some of them happy, some of them not so happy, we also arrive at an important milestone uh, in the calendar of the NIH family, which is the first Wednesday afternoon lecture. And it is a great pleasure to welcome all of you and our speaker uh, to what I am sure is going to be a fascinating presentation. Uh, for those of you who are new here, uh, we do this uh, every Wednesday afternoon or most Wednesday afternoons. We have a fascinating array of speakers that are brought in from all over the place who are chosen uh, by their peers as really experts in a particular field and also people who are particularly good at presenting the science that they're doing in a fashion that's accessible to a wide audience. Uh, we love it for those of you who come here in person because you get the full experience, but we also welcome those who join us uh, by the web, and we know there are several hundred of you out there this afternoon uh, taking in the presentation through that mechanism. Uh, and the way we do this, uh, just to set the stage, is the uh, presenter will go through a, uh, an elegant, I'm sure, presentation of the work uh, that he or she has done each time we have one of these. Then there will be a time for Q&A, and there are microphones in the aisles where we will ask people uh, to go to the microphone so that those listening to the web can hear the question. And then at the conclusion of the presentation and the discussion, we will adjourn to the library, which many of you know is right over there, uh, where there is coffee and cookies and a chance for you to speak uh, to the speaker more informally if you have other questions you want to pose, or just to have some coffee and cookies with your colleagues. So again, welcome to this year's series. Uh, if you haven't seen the full lineup, have a look. It's really quite an amazing roster of presenters that we have uh, coming to speak to us this year. Well, it is my pleasure to introduce today's lecturer, Carlos Bustamante, who is Professor of Molecular and Cell Biology, Physics, and Chemistry at the University of California, Berkeley, and an investigator of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Professor Bustamante has been a pioneer in the field of mechanochemistry, inventing ingenious single molecule methods to manipulate and investigate proteins, DNA, and RNA. Using magnetic and laser tweezers, he and his group have been able to measure the tiny mechanical forces that allow macromolecules to drive living processes, increasing our understanding of how cells and organisms work. He is a member of the National Academy since 2002, a recipient of numerous prestigious awards, including the Alexander Hollander Award in Biophysics from the National Academy of Sciences, the Hans Neurath Award of the Protein Society, and the Biological Physics Prize of the American Physical Society. Uh, he grew up in Peru, uh, just learned that his father thought he was going to be a physician, and he gamely went through the process uh, of learning some of those skills, but got seduced uh, by the science along the way and decided instead what he really wished to do was to become a biochemist and then ultimately migrated into biophysics. Uh, he did his PhD uh, as a Fulbright Scholar at UC Berkeley and uh, went on from that experience to develop the methods uh, that uh, includes the things he's going to talk about today in involving the use of optical imaging methods to study ordered structures on very small scales. Uh, a seminal paper of his in 1992 in science combined magnetic beads and buffer flow to manipulate a single DNA molecule to study its elastic properties. And ever since, he has very much been at the forefront of the studies of such properties, utilizing scanning probe microscopes and optical tweezers and everything in between. So in today's talk, he's going to tell us about what one could learn about the mechanism of one of the strongest known molecular motors of the biological world in a talk entitled Grabbing the Cat by the Tail, Discrete Steps by a DNA Packaging Motor and the Inter-Subunit Coordination in a Ring ATPase. So please join me in giving a warm welcome on this rainy day to Professor Carlos Bustamante. Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me? No? It's, okay. So um, uh, today I'm going to tell you about a system that we have been studying for quite a long time now, almost 10 years, and where we use the kind of methods of single molecule manipulation to try to understand how is that these molecules 
actually do the kind of things that they do. And, um, well, I want to start by remember, reminding you that many central processes in biology actually are carried out by machine-like molecular entities, and that many of these machines actually function as molecular motors, namely they are converters of energy. They can convert one form of energy, chemical energy mostly, into mechanical energy or work, and they are therefore able to generate force and torque in the process. Now, in my laboratory, we are very interested in studying some of these molecules, some of these machines, which are mostly nucleic acid translocases. Namely, they bind to DNA or to RNA in double-stranded form or single-stranded form, and by using energy, perhaps hydrolysis energy or maybe uh, binding energy, they actually move the molecules of DNA relative to themselves. And what we are interested is in trying to understand what are the biological designs and the physical principles that underlie this conversion of chemical energy into mechanical work. And uh, we do that by using methods of single molecule, and today I'm going to tell you about one particular translocase that uh, belongs to the ASCII division of P-loop NTPases. These are, this is a large, here you see a cladogram that shows many of the ATPases that are involved in a number of important cellular functions, and they, you can see the various superfamilies, the clades and the superfamilies associated with those clades. And so many of these uh, ATPases carry function as important as transport across the membrane or transport of DNA or transport uh, of DNA across the septum, etc. Uh, the one particular one I'm going to tell you about is one that sits at the base of a bacteriophage, bacteriophage Phi29, which uh, is a bacteriophage of Bacillus subtilis, and it belongs to this superfamily, the HER A FTSK superfamily. FTSK, you may remember, is also an ATPase that is involved in the segregation of the chromosomes in E. coli during division, cell division. Okay, so let me show you first the phage we are working with, and that's shown here. This is a cryo-electron micrograph reconstruction, and you see that this is not a very large phage. It's an icosahedral phage, 40 nanometers by about 50 nanometers, and in this small volume, which is less than 70 millimicrons cube, this motor, which is shown here in color, has to perform the task of introducing and package the 19,285 base pairs that makes up the genome of the virus. So in fact, the virus is about six and a half microns uh, long, and it has to be fit inside this, this, the, the head of the bacteriophage. Now, naturally, this is not an easy task. And in fact, if you uh, make a calculation in terms of the total amount of DNA that is packaged at the end, and the volume of the bacteriophage, you will find that the concentration of DNA inside the bacteriophage uh, head is about 500 milligrams per milliliter. As you may remember, when you crystallize DNA and you form crystals of DNA, typically the concentration of DNA in the crystals is between 300 to 400 milligrams per milliliter. So, in fact, this motor carries the fate, of the, the, the task of actually uh, putting DNA inside the bacteriophage head at crystalline densities. Okay, so now let me tell you what we know about the motor. The motor is made up of three concentric rings. The first one is called the connector, the head-tail connector, which is a dodecamer for which we have a crystal structure sold in Michael Rosman's laboratory in the year 2000. It has an opening in the center, about 36 Armstrongs, which allows DNA to go through. Then, surprisingly, there is a pentameric ring of RNA. So this is shown here in red. So there is a molecule of, five molecules of RNA forming this ring. And we are uh, very surprised still about the presence of this RNA because we don't know what the function is. All I can tell you is that it is essential for the motor to do the work. And finally, there are the cylinders of the engine themselves. These are the ATP aces five copies of the ATPase, GT, GP16 ATPase, and so, in fact, we think of our motor as a five-cylinder engine. 
Okay? Now, they are the ones that convert the chemical energy of DNA of ATP into mechanical work and fourth generation. Okay, so the kind of experiments that we are going to do is we are going to try to follow the process of packaging of DNA into the head of the bacteriophage using a single molecule assay. And to do that, what we do is we grab bacteriophages that have been stopped in the process of packaging the DNA and in which the distal part of the DNA has a biotin at the end, as you show, is shown here by this triangle. And then we attach these bacteriophage heads to the surface of a bead that contains antibody against the protein, the main protein in the capsid. And this bead is held atop this micropipette by suction. And the other end of the DNA, we grab it by another bead, which is covered by a streptavidin, which binds to that biotin, and that bead is held inside the optical trap, which is an, simply a laser, a focus laser, that is indicated here by the tick marks, okay? So now that we have this arrangement, that we can make in the laboratory, then we can play now tug of war with one of these motors, because the motor, of course, sits at the base of the bacteriophage, and now when we add ATP, the motor will start trying to pack the D package the DNA, but we can, in fact, move the pipette away or closer to the bead in the trap, and in that way we can actually increase or decrease the mechanical load that the motor feels while it's doing the packaging. The distance between the ends of the DNA, of course, is, uh, can be monitored as a function of time. Naturally, the motor, the, this DNA that is outside the bacteriophage will tend to get shorter with time as packaging proceeds. And that's what you see here in this plot, where you have, see four different uh, traces corresponding to four different bacteriophages packaging their DNA. And you can see that as the time progresses, in fact, the DNA tether length gets shorter and since we are plotting here length versus time, the slope of these curves is the rate of packaging, which typically is of the order of between 100 and 120 base pairs per second. Okay? So you see that, in fact, this is nice because, in fact, we know from in vivo situation that the packaging of the DNA inside the bacterium during the infection cycle, in fact, occurs at rates of the order of 100 base pairs per second. So we have an assay that pretty much reproduces the kind of packaging that probably takes place inside the, the bacteriophage. Now, we are studying a bacteriophage, ATPase, this motor, this ring motor of five ATPases, but we are hoping that from studying this system, we may learn more about other ring ATPases, like the ones I showed you in, the, in that cladogram, that will tell us something about how they work and what are the general principles of how they work. Okay, so I'm going to summarize what we have learned through the past years about this motor. First, it's a very strong motor, capable of generating forces as high as 60 piconewtons. Now, you may say, well, what is 60 piconewtons, right? Well, let me just mention that myosin, which is the motor by definition in our muscles, can generate only forces between 3 and 5 piconewtons. So this motor can generate forces between 15 to uh, 20 times larger than myosin. Okay, so it's a very strong motor. As it packages, in fact, we learned that there is an internal pressure that is generated of DNA that builds up, and that internal pressure slows down the motor towards the end of packaging, and in fact, that pressure attains the value of about 60 atmospheres of pressure. Okay, so at the end of packaging, the DNA inside the head of the bacteriophage is at 60 atmospheres. Now, again, what is 60 atmospheres? We live under one atmosphere. Sometimes that sounds, seems enough, right? Now, 60 atmospheres is a lot more, but if you look in the internet, you will find that um, a bottle of champagne, in order to be sold as such internationally, has to have a pressure of carbon dioxide of about between five and six atmospheres. So the next time you open your bottle of champagne, remember the bacteriophage. See, the cork comes out at the pressure of about six atmospheres. The DNA at the end of packaging is at the pressure of 10 times that pressure at which the cork pops, okay? 
Now, obviously, this was very surprising, and the reason we believe that happens, so here it is, you can see how the rate of packaging goes down as the percentage of the genome gets packaged, eventually going to zero after the DNA is packaged more than its normal length of DNA. Okay, and here is the internal pressure that actually builds up inside the head of the bacteriophage. And the reason they do that, apparently, is because during infection, the bacteriophage can use that pressure in order to inject the DNA inside the bacterium. In other words, the design is very clever. It converts chemical energy, the motor, into mechanical potential energy in the form of a loaded spring at 60 atmospheres of pressure, and then when the time comes to do the next infection, in the next cycle of infection, the DNA comes out at the pressure of 60 atmospheres. Well, we also learned that the power stroke occurs during the release of uh, uh, phosphate, inorganic phosphate, in the motor, and here, is the, here are the kinetic parameters, Vmax of 100 base per, per second, Km of 31 micromolar, and a Hill coefficient of 1, indicating that the ATPases seem to be binding DNA in a non-cooperative manner. Okay, that is, was a little surprising, this result, because we did the following experiment at the time. We found that if we add little amounts of non-hydrolyzable ATP, like gamma S ATP or AMP PNP, this non-hydrolyzable ATP induces pauses, long pauses in the motor, indicating that the firing of the ATPases are highly coordinated and it occurs in some kind of sequence. In other words, that they are somewhat coordinated in their, in their activities. In other words, that if you block one of the ATPases in the ring of five ATPases, the motor completely stops until it can exchange that ATP, non-hydrolyzable ATP, for a hydrolyzable one. And that explains this, this process. In fact, if you do a density of pause plot versus the concentration of non-hydrolyzable ATP, you get a linear dependence indicating that a single ATP, non-hydrolyzable ATP, is sufficient to pause the motor. And if the ATPases are so coordinated and they mind what, whether the other ATPase is firing or not, then why the Hill coefficient is equal to 1? I will leave that as a mystery at the end. Okay, so here is the model that we had about this motor to try to understand how it works. We imagine that actually there is some kind of ordinal sequence in which the ATPases fire, and that every time the ATP binds, it gets hydrolyzed, it releases the phosphate, and during the release of the phosphate, which are these little stars that you see there, actually there is a power stroke that propels the DNA by two base pairs for every ATP that has been hydrolyzed. We know that from uh, bulk studies, two base pairs per ATP. Okay, so now I'm going to ask a couple of questions that are newer questions about this motor. First of all, what is the nature of the motor DNA interaction that allows the motor to generate forces as high as 60 piconewtons and work against pressure as high as 60 atmospheres? The other question I'm going to ask is what is the step size of the motor measured directly via single molecule approach? And finally, are the mechanochemical cycles of the individual subunits coordinated in the overall cycle? And if so, how is this coordination taking place? Okay, so to answer the first question, we decided that probably it was a good guess that there was some kind of electrostatic component to the interaction between the DNA and the and the motor. And so we decided to see if there was any specific contacts that the motor made with the double helix. And so, and then we wanted to know, does the motor interact with both strands or only with one of them? In order to answer this, we decided to modify the DNA that was being packaged by the DNA, by the motor, and transform the phosphates into methyl phosphonates, as indicated here. So you see that actually the structure is very similar. In fact, NMR studies of methyl phosphonate DNA has shown that it actually maintains its double helical structure pretty much, but of course it has no charge. So the question is, what happens if we now feed 10 base pairs indicated here in red without charge that has been converted in methyl phosphonate? 
what does the motor do? And here you can see that, in fact, many of the motors actually sense the presence of the chargeless DNA, and some of them pause for a long time before eventually they manage to go through. This region in brown is where the 10 base pairs are supposed to be. So, in fact, some other motors actually pause for much less time and they eventually go through. And finally, there are a few of the motors that don't seem to actually care whether there is charge or not, but they are the minority. There is also some of them that actually are very picky about the DNA they package, apparently, because you see that they stop for a while, and after a while they decide they don't want to do this anymore. And so they just let the DNA go, and all the DNA slips out. But here is the statistics. You see that the percentage of package, naturally, actually, through this chargeless DNA, uh, decreases with the applied tension in the in the DNA, the, the tension we apply, by 20 piconewtons, only about 37% of the, of the motors are capable of going through the DNA. So what you see here is that, in fact, there is an effect of the charge, but it's not all the story, because if it would be all the interactions that the motor can make with the DNA, then you would expect that by eliminating the charge, you will completely uh, abolish packaging, but that's not what happens. Okay, so there must be some, also some non-electrostatic contacts. And in fact, this is uh, supported by the fact that if you make this, instead of making 10 base pairs, you make it 30 base pairs, you see that now the probability of crossing 30 base pairs without charge becomes very, very small. At 5, 0.5 piconewtons of force, you are packaging 10, less than 10% of the time you can cross these 30 base pairs, and at 5 piconewtons, less than 1% of the time you can go across the 30 base pairs. So now you may ask, does it matter which strand has charge, right, or not? And you can answer that by feeding, by creating the following construct, one in which the strand that is 3 prime to 5 prime in the direction of packaging has been neutralized by methyl phosphonate, and the other in which the other strand, the 5 prime to 3 prime, has been neutralized in the direction of packaging. And now you ask, does it make a difference? And the answer is yes, it makes a big difference. Notice that in this case, for if you neutralize the 3 prime to 5 prime in the direction of packaging, at 20 piconewtons of force, you are still packaging at about 70% rate. Okay? Whereas in this case, in the 5 prime to 3 prime, with 5 piconewtons of force, less than 7% of the time you can package through the through the DNA, okay? So that indicates that the motor predominantly tracks the five prime to three prime strand, making important electrostatic contacts with the DNA, and that those contacts are important to actually carry out a processive packaging of the DNA. Well, finally, you can ask, is there a critical length scale in which important phosphate contacts are made? And you can do that by varying the size of the neutralize DNA from 1, 2, 3, all the way to 10 or 15 base pairs. And the answer is that it makes no difference until you get to 10 base pairs. But when you make more than 10 base pairs, 10 or more than 10 base pairs neutral, then suddenly there is a big drop in the amount of DNA package, which we don't see when you go, say, from 11 to 15. So in fact, we conclude that the motor is making important electrostatic contacts every 10 base pairs along the DNA. And in between, probably is making not so important electrostatic contacts, probably more of a um, um, static nature with the ma major groove of the DNA. We know that because we actually, in this same study, we actually put pieces of DNA that had no bases. So a basic DNA, and the motor was able to package pieces of DNA with a basic DNA. We put pieces of um, DNA where we had actually uh, modified, that was single strand, and we was able to package single strand. Finally, ultimately, we said, well, let's put a piece of polymer that has nothing to do with DNA, that doesn't even look like DNA. It's more like polyethylene glycol, and it was able to package that polyethylene glycol. So it's clear that in between these important 10 base per electrostatic 
contacts, the motor can grab anything, whatever it can grab, and actually can propel the DNA into the, into the capsid. So important phosphate contacts are made by the motor every 10 base pairs. Remember this number because it's going to become important right away. So finally, the question of what is the coordination between the ATPases. In order to answer that, we needed to be able, and what is the step size of the motor, we needed to actually improve the resolution of our measurement. And in order to improve the resolution, we needed to be able to see, to grab a bacteriophage, to grab the DNA, and then when the motor step by one single step, we needed to be able to resolve that step, okay? For that, we had to build an optical tweezers instrument that had one Armstrong resolution at room temperature, okay? Now, that's one Armstrong resolution. Remember, that's the diameter of a hydrogen atom, right? So that, as you um, may, know, is not e may, may know, is not easy, particularly due to thermal motion and due to the number of things that actually conspire against you, including the fact that if you are in California, the ground is shaking all the time. So we had to actually build an instrument that was mechanically insulated on the third sub-basement of our building. That was the slab of the laboratory was separated from the rest of the building so that in fact the shaking of the building did not affect the laboratory directly. It was thermally insulated to 0.1 degree centigrade and finally it was acoustically isolated as a, as a studio, as a recording studio, because the voice of the students was enough to actually, of course, introduce noise larger than one Armstrong. In fact, the students, when they use this instrument, cannot enter the room, cannot be inside the room, because the body produces about a power of about 100 watts, and that's enough to actually make the machine drift. Just by the presence of a human body inside the room. So, in fact, they have to work outside the room. But it can be done, and I can show you here how if we separate one of the, we use a double trap optical tweezers, as indicated here, and we can move one of them relative to the other, say by 3.4 Armstrongs, which is the distance between one base pair, and you see that we can pick up very clearly these 3.4 Armstrongs at different bandwidths, as shown here. And in fact, a pairwise distribution function between all the points in this curve or in this red curve clearly indicate the periodicity of 3.4, 6.8, and multiples of a single base pair. So in fact, we have the resolution to be able to detect the step size of the motor. Now, of course, if the step size of the motor is smaller than one Armstrong, we won't be able to resolve it, but we suspected that a motor will have a step size of one, one base pair or more, right? So. Okay, so let me now remind you what is what we expected to see in this case. So what we expected to see was this. We thought that the motor will wait for a while, bind ATP, hydrolyze, and translocate upon phosphate release. Bind, hydrolyze, translocate, bind, hydrolyze, translocate, like that. Since there are five ATP aces, we will see one of these five translocation cycles for every cycle of the whole motor. That's the idea, right? So the motor binds ATP, hydrolyzes ATP, and then releases the phosphate, and during the release of the phosphate is the power stroke, okay? So this is, let's say we are plotting here the length of the DNA versus time, and we will expect it to see the length decreasing in this fashion. Okay, so as often is the case, oh, and two base pairs for each one of these steps, right? As often uh, is the case, we made experiment too many for this model because when you look at the actual data, what you find is that the motor, in fact, does package in this dwell and burst type of fashion, but the bursts are not two base pairs as we expected, but 10 base pairs. And in fact, that 10 base pair and this dwell and burst behavior is independent of the concentration of ATP, whether you are below the KM, 5 micromolar, or whether you are far above the KM, 250 micromolar. You see that there is 10 base pairs, 10 base pairs, 10 base pairs, and so on and so forth. So, in fact, 
while packaging occurs in cycles of dwell and bird phases, the steps are not two base pairs, but they are 10 base pairs. And that was very surprising. So let me now show you what happens with these dwell times. Um, well, let me show you first the pairwise distribution function for all these curves. These are shown here in color, and you can see that the periodicity is very clear. You get 0, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. So it's very clear that these are separated by 10 base pairs. Now, the dual time distribution that I was showing you, here is the dual time. These dual times are, of course, stochastic. So they vary from, from step to step. And the question is, how are they distributed? What is the probability of observing a dual time of a particular length? And that is shown here. Instead of being exponentially decaying, as you may expect for a single process, such as binding of ATP, they are actually picked distributions, shown here in green for a concentration below the KM, and in red for a concentration above the KM. So in fact, the fact that these distributions of dwell times are highly picked suggests that more than one ATP is binding to the motor during that dwell time, okay? So we ask, does phi 29 bind ATP to multiple subunits and then packages in a burst of several states of two base pairs per bound ATP, okay? So again, let me show you this distribution of dwell times. Here are the dwell times, as I told you, they are stochastically distributed. So in fact, you can say, what is that distribution? Well, the distribution depends on the concentration of ATP, of course, because the more ATP you put, the shorter time it is for the ATP to bind. But the distribution is picked in all cases, whether you are below the KM or you are above the KM. Now, you can plot the mean of the distribution, right? The mean length of the time required to finish a dwell, right? versus the concentration of ATP over three orders of magnitude of ATP. And what you find is that it decreases as an inverse hyperbola, indicating that N, the Hill coefficient for binding of ATP, is equal to one again. No sigmoidicity here. Remember? You expect sigmoidicity if there is cooperativity in binding. And we again obtain that N is equal to one. Well, of course, you may ask, what happens during a burst? Here is a burst. This is not instantaneous, as indicated here. It takes a time. So what is the length of the burst? Does it depend on the concentration of ATP? The answer is, it's independent of the concentration of ATP. So now we know that all the binding of ATP is occurring during the dwell time, and that during the burst time, the only thing that is happening is perhaps the release of the phosphate and the power stroking, right? OK. So here is a new packaging model that I'm proposing to you. This motor has a very coordinated interaction between the ATPases and also between the ATPases and the ATP. The packaging occurs in phases. There is a binding phase or dwell phase during which the motor binds N ATPs, right? And then there is a burst phase or packaging phase during which the motor actually packages the DNA, all right, in, in increments of 10 base pairs. And of course, the question is, well, there are n steps, right? And the question then is, how many ATPs is n ATPs, and how many steps are n steps, right? So in order to answer this question, what we need to do is we need to be able to resolve the sub-steps within this 10 base per step, right? Now, one problem with that is that I cannot slow it down just by decreasing the concentration of ATP, because I just showed you that the time it takes to make this 10 base per burst is independent of the concentration of ATP. But what I can do is I can use force. Because remember, I'm grabbing the DNA, and by applying more tension, since this is the time where the motor is really producing movement, right, I may be able to actually slow down the motor by actually increase the tension on the DNA. And so the idea is to essentially increase the tension on the DNA to slow down that burst and resolve the individual sub-steps inside the step. 
Okay, so that's what we did. And fortunately, this is a motor that works at very high forces, all the way to 60 piconewtons of force, and therefore we could apply between 30 and 40 piconewtons and get this process to occur slow enough that we were able to distinguish the individual substeps. So we did that experiment, we were expecting to see two base pairs per ATP, and once again, here it is, in fact, at high forces between 40 and 50 piconewtons, we can see substeps as shown here, but now the dashed lines are not separated by 10 base pairs, they are separated by two and a half base pairs. Okay, now, that was pretty bad, two and a half base pairs. When my students came and told me, we have the answer, the motor packages the DNA in steps of two and a half base pairs, the first problem was, how come in bulk they measure two base pairs instead of two and a half, but not only that, how do you want to publish this? I mean, biologists don't like anything that is not integer number. And two and a half sounds like a crazy number. So I told them, I don't believe it. Go back and repeat this data. They did it very, very, very sportively. They went back and did it. And this time they came back and they told me it is two and a half. The pairwise distribution function shows very clearly you know, where the distribution of the distances between all points in these curves shows very clearly a peak at 2.5, the next one at 5, the next one at 7.5, and so on and so forth. So, in fact, it's very clear that it is 2.5. And, and, in fact, they pointed out that it wasn't 2.5. It actually was 2.4 plus minus 0 0.1 base pairs. Okay? That's the precision. This is the standard error of the mean. That's the precision with which we can actually determine the step size of one of these, of these power strokes by one of the ATP aces. And since there are 10 base pairs in one full burst, it follows that there must be four 2.5 base pair steps in every burst, right? And therefore, that four ATPs are bound to the motor and are hydrolyzed actively for translocation. Now, what happens to the fifth ATP or the fifth ATPase? We don't know for sure. Something breaks the symmetry, and I can propose you different mechanisms by which you can break the symmetry of the ring. For example, in the last cycle, the last ATPase remains bound to ADP. So for the next cycle, there are only four ATP sites available for binding ATP, and so you just naturally break the symmetry of the ring in that fashion. There are other possible uh, mechanisms. So here is the new packaging model again. You have four ATPs at least binding during the dual time, and certainly four ATPs are being used to translocate the DNA in four steps of two and a half base pairs, right? And look what it means, okay? This motor, what well, this, mo this mechanism means is the following, that these ATP aces are extremely coordinated because they bind one ATP, and the motor is not allowed to do anything. Then a second one, then a third one, then a fourth one, and only then the motor says, okay, now, hydrolyze and translocate. And that requires enormous amount of coordination. And because of that, I was very surprised that every time we got to investigate what is the cooperativity between the ATPs binding to the motor, we got a Hill coefficient equal to one, n equal to one. That was very surprising. So how can we reconcile the binding of multiple ATPs in this highly coordinated cycle with the non-sigmoidal n equal one dependence? Okay, so that's the last part of this talk, and I want to carry you through the analysis that we made. In order to understand this, we said, let's simplify the system. And let's assume that we have just two motors, enzyme, enzyme, empty. Then one of them can bind one ATP loosely. Then it can bind tightly that ATP. Then the next one binds loosely, then binds tightly, then hydrolyzes, releases, and then gets back to the empty double motor, right? Back to here. Well, you can solve the kinetic equations for this, and you will find that your velocity versus the ATP concentration is given by this rather ugly expression, right? Notice that depends on the quadratic 
power of the ATP in the numerator and zero power and zero first and second power in the denominator. So this doesn't look at all like Michael is menting, right? And in fact, the end coefficient that we will derive from this will be greater than one and you will have a sigmoidicity. Well, these A's and B's are these coefficients that are rather ugly. But now, you ask, what do I have to do to this system so that even though it is occurring in this order and coordinated fashion, still n appears equal to 1, okay? And the answer is, all you have to do is make the step where the binding of ATP goes from loose binding or docking to tight binding, which is this T asterisk, in both cases, irreversible. So by making K2 minus and K4 minus essentially going to zero, then these values are zero, then these terms are zero, and when you take the ratio, you get Michaelis Menten behavior. Substrate in the numerator, K plus substrate in the denominator, and N is equal to one. In other words, that even though the system is highly coordinated, the fact that actually the bindings of ATP are occurring in an, separated by an irreversible step is sufficient to give an apparent Hill coefficient equal to one, even though there is actually high coordination in the process. But you may ask, what about the order of binding? Because in a sense, you are cheating because you are making the first ATP bind and you don't allow the second ATP to bind unless the first ATP has actually tight bind. So that is a particular, a particular scheme. A more general scheme would be this, where you bind one ATP loosely and then you allow the next one to bind ATP loosely, either this way or that way, right? Before you go to tight binding, either way. So what about this? Well, you can solve the kinetic equation for this system and the expression is even uglier as shown here. Now you depend on the second and third order of ATP, zero first, second and third order of ATP, and the end Hill coefficient, of course, is greater than one. You get a sigmoidal dependence. Unless you ask again, what do I have to do for this system for n to be equal to one, which is what I observe experimentally? And the answer is, as before, the tight binding step has to be almost irreversible for both enzymes, but another ray constant has to be zero. K3 has to be equal to zero, okay? So if you ask, what do I have to do in order to make this to look like Michael is menting with n equal one, as before, K2 and K4, which I now labeling, K minus two and K minus four, which I'm labeling the same way, is zero, but now K3 has to be zero. And if you do that, then these coefficients are zero, and now you regain Michaelis Menten expression n equal one. But what is K3? K3 is the rate that allows the second ATPase to bind loosely ATP before the first ATPase has bound tightly the ATP. In other words, that this is not allowed. If you allow this state, actually, then your Hill coefficient will be greater than one, and that's not what we measure. So essentially, this is the riddle of the motor. The motor is telling us, I'm highly coordinated, but n is equal to one. Solve the problem, solve the riddle. And the riddle gives you two pieces of information. One is that the tight binding of ATP is rather irreversible, okay? And second, that actually the ATP, the next ATPase cannot bind loosely its ATP if the previous ATPase have actually not bound tightly its ATP. So the only acceptable routes are the one this way or the one this way, but not one in which you form this state. So in fact, the riddle of the motor tells us that additional information, the binding is time ordered. Now, how does, will that happen? Well, it's easy to imagine in a ring because here is the ATPase that is ready to bind loosely ATP. There it is, it bound loosely ATP. And then it goes into tight binding, which is an irreversible step here, see, tight binding. And now that communicates to the next ATP, which cannot bind ATP loosely, see, it's closed here, the next ATPase. But once this binds tightly, 
the next one now opens to bind loosely, then it binds tightly, then opens the next one to bind loosely, and so on and so forth. So it's easy to imagine a mechanism by which in a ring, in fact, you can communicate and highly coordinate the binding of ATP along the ring. Okay, so here is a revised model. We have two segregated phases, binding and packaging. The binding allows for the binding of four ATPs at least, and the burst corresponds to four steps of two and a half base pairs, right? As I show here, two and a half, two and a half, two and a half, two and a half, right? And there is a fifth subunit that has a different, the different behavior. The symmetry is broken somehow. Okay, so let me put all of this model into a single movie that actually my students prepare, and hopefully you will get a sense of what we have learned about this motor. Um, this comes from an electron microscope re re reconstruction, and uh, you will see that at the beginning of the cycle, there is an ADP binding bound into the binding site of the pentameric ATPA, so there are only four ATP sites to bind, and that's how in this model, at least, we explain the breaking of the symmetry. So there it is. You can see that there was an ADP bound here previously from the previous cycle, and every time an ATP binds, it cocks the ATP aces are, that are now, whose end loops are actually able to translocate the DNA for the hydrolysis upon release of the phosphate. Hydrolysis release, and the release actually produces the power stroke. See? At the end of the cycle, there is one ADP left bound to the ring, and then again, the new cycle starts. ATP binds to the ring, cocks the ATP aces and prepares them to actually hydrolyze and release of the phosphate, which is accompanied by a power stroke. There it is. And the DNA actually gets internalized by two, two and a half base pairs for every ATP. All right, so this is what we knew until very recently, a month ago or so, and um, unfortunately we continue doing experiments, and so I'm sorry to tell you that this model is very incomplete because it doesn't take into account about the following. You probably may be asking yourself what happens to the DNA when the packaging occurs that the DNA get rotated? Well, there is a way we can actually answer that question by doing the same experiment that I showed you before with the pipette and the bead and the bead and the phage in the bead in the optical trap, but now we are going to put a tiny little rotor bead on the side of the DNA, okay? And as packaging proceeds, we want to look at this rotor bead and see if this bead, in fact, is rotating as the packaging proceeds, okay? So here is the construct that we use and so the question is, does the motor rotate the DNA and does it generate torque? Okay, so here is the experiment again. There is a tiny bit in the middle and I'm going to show you a movie. I think you can see that as the packaging proceeds, the DNA in fact is being rotated by the motor, and in fact, the distance between the bits is getting shorter as the packaging proceeds, but the DNA is being twisted. All right? So, in fact, we can actually uh, follow the bit angle as a function of time versus the length of the DNA as a function of time, which both are changing in a systematic fashion. And we can tell that the twist that the motor applies to the DNA is in the direction of unwinding the DNA, so in this direction, right? Unwinding the DNA as indicated here. Um, there is a minor problem that we have to solve, of course, and is that what we are looking is at the bit angle but the bit angle is equal to the DNA angle that is imposed by the phage minus the lag due to the hydrodynamic drag of the little bead, but written in, in mathematical expression is indicated here, 
but we can, can quantitate the DNA, the drag, the delta theta angle due to the lag, because we know then that what is happening is that the motor is twisting the DNA, but because of the bead having a big drag, right, the little bead, still having a big drag, what is going to happen is that the DNA is going to be unwinding itself a little bit, right? And that unwinding, going back to its normal form, is what is really driving the motor, the, what is really driving the bead rotation. So we want to calculate what is the amount of torque stored in the DNA. Well, we know that the torque stored in the DNA is equal to the constant of torsional stiffness of the molecule, C, divided by the length of the DNA, which we know, multiplied by de delta theta lag, which is the quantity we want to know. Now, we need to know what is the torque stored in the DNA, but we also know that the torque stored in the DNA is equal to the friction coefficient of the bead, which we know from Stokes' law, times the angular velocity of the bead, which we can measure experimentally. So in fact, we can replace that there, and then solve for delta lag, and then we can plug that delta lag here, and we can correct, as you see, the blue curve with the green curve, which correspond to the actual DNA angle from the bead angle that we measure experimentally. Okay, so it's a correction that needs to be made, but can be made. And what we find is that the, re the rotation of the DNA changes as the percentage of the DNA of the genome has been packaged. So in fact, when there is a lot of DNA inside the head of the bacteriophage, the rotation of the DNA is much larger, and it decreases, decreases, as you decrease the amount of DNA at the beginning of packaging. And of course, what we would like to know is what happens at very low fillings, in fact, at 0% filling, not at 100% filling. Why? Because of the following. I'm going to risk it here now for a second and connect, disconnect my computer, you see, if you have a bead outside and the packaging of your DNA actually is like this, as we imagine, believe it is from electron microscopy, notice what happens to the bead. The bead is rotating. So there is a rotation due to the fact that the DNA is organized in a coil inside of the, of the head. And that explains why it is changing when the amount of DNA inside the head actually increases. But what we want to know is what happens to the motor when there is no coiling. The problem is how do we avoid coiling inside the head of the virus, okay? Um, well, the solution turns out to be actually quite um, nationalistic. I come from Peru, as you know, and our museums are full of trepanated heads. This is a technique that the Incas and the pre-Incas developed um, in order to actually save patients from the, from the swelling of the brain after bottles where they got actually brain swelling as a result of the concussion. And in fact, we know that many of these patients survived because they put pieces of gold to close the, the trepanation and the bone grew over the gold, indicating that the patients were alive for many years afterwards. In fact, from this study, uh, we know that actually uh, there was a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, this was a very, very common among the, the soldiers in the empire. So, Anyway, so we decided we were going to try to trepanate our heads, and we didn't know how to do that, but eventually we found that if we freeze and thaw the heads many, many times, eventually the bacteriophage heads behave very differently than the normal heads. If you have a normal head, right, prohead, then as the DNA enters the bacteriophage head, the rate of packaging, which is the slope here, slows down, because of the pressure, the internal pressure of DNA. But notice that in these fro frozen and thawed uh, heads, the rate of packaging is 
independent of the amount of DNA entering. Obviously because the DNA is coming out by the hole in the head, right? Naturally. And so that's what we, and we found, in fact you may ask about the morbidity and mortality, uh, it says the Cusco trepanation survival rate reached 90% at one point and was, was accompanied by a low frequency of infec infection, 4.5%. Okay, so we actually found that 25% of the, of the phages uh, are trepanated in this process, but 80% or more of the phages are very weak or dead. They cannot package DNA. Unless you add RNA, you add extra RNA, and that RNA replaces the damaged RNA, and now 90% of the bacteriophages that are now trepanated package DNA. So now you can ask what happens, what is the twist that the motor produces to the DNA when there is no coiling inside the head. And here is the result. The answer that you, the most important thing is that it's minus 1.2 degrees per base pair in the direction of unfolding the DNA. And those are the points that we get here. And the question is, can we rationalize that? And the answer is yes, because, because remember, the motor packages the DNA in increments of 10 base pairs, but the periodicity of DNA is 10.5 base pairs, right? That's the periodicity of, of DNA. And remember that the motor make, has to make a contact every 10 base pairs or 11 base pairs. That is very important electrostatically. But after having gone through five ATPases, the motor has four times 2.5 is 10, is 14 degrees behind. So it needs to twist the DNA by 14 degrees. We measure 12 because 1.2 per base pair times 10 is 12. So in fact, we believe that this is perfectly consistent with the fact that every 10 base pair there is this important phosphate contact that has to be made and that requires the DNA to be twisted by 12 degrees, 14 degrees approximately, uh, which actually is the rotation that we see experimentally. Okay, so I want to uh, acknowledge the people that have done the work. This work has been done by four very talented postdocs, Sander Tans, who is now at the Amolf in the Netherlands, Doug Smith, who is a professor at UC San Diego, Jan Chemla, who is now a professor at uh, the University of Illinois Champaign-Urbana, and Ariel Kaplan, who is now a professor at the Technion in Israel. And then the work has been done in collaboration with, uh, well, by students, graduate students, Ati, who did the work with uh, neutralized DNA, Jeff Moffitt, who did the beautiful work with high resolution of the individual sub-steps. Craig Harrington, who did the work for the twisting of the DNA that you just saw. And Jorge Chistol, that actually trained under Jeff Moffitt and is still a graduate student in the lab. And the biologists that are our collaborators at the University of Minnesota are Dwight Anderson, Shelley Grimes, and Paul Jardine. So I just want to say that I forgot to put, why do I call this the grabbing the cat by the tail? The reason is that Mark Twain has a very nice um, dictum. He said, I met once a man who grabbed the cat by the tail, and he learned 40% more about cats than the rest of us. So that's the motto of our laboratories is we are in the business of grabbing and pulling. Thank you very much. Questions for Dr. Bustamante. Ron. Do you have a way of knowing whether the fifth subunit of the ATPase ring is always the same non-performer or whether you're stochastically moving around the members of the ring? Uh, yeah, excellent question. Um, yes, we do. And by using uh, non-hydrolyzable ATP and by using um, tightly bound ADP, which is uh, uh, aluminum fluoride ADP, actually we are now able to tell that the subunit is always the same under normal condition. There are situations in which actually 
the motor gets out of phase, but those are the rare conditions. When it is actually packaging every 10 base pairs, it is always the safe sum unit. Very elegant study, thank you. Thank you. Um, my question, maybe not fair, uh, but you mentioned that uh, in the model that you had, that the packaging of the DNA is also associated with some RNA molecules. Are these RNA uh, protecting or stabilizing uh, the formation or the integrity of uh, coiling? Yeah. Uh, actually, the RNA is part of the motor itself. It's five copies of RNA that form a pentameric ring and that is associates with the connector and also associate with the five, the ring of five ATPases, GP16. So the RNA is present there, and I said that we don't know at all what it does, but actually we know a few things. It is made out of 174 nucleotides. It forms a secondary structure, a tertiary structure actually, in space, and it forms kissing loop interactions to form the ring. You can cut 54 of the 174 nucleotides, so you are left with 120 nucleotides, and it still can form the ring and it still can package. If you cut one more nucleotide, stops working, the motor stops working. But the shortened RNA with 120 base pairs now has developed a problem, and this is the problem. Mm -hmm. Normally, the 154, the complete RNA molecule, always packages the genome in the same way. The left-hand side of the genome always enters first the bacteriophage head than the right-hand side of the genome. When you get rid of the 54 nucleotides in the, in the RNA, then now the DNA can enter either way, left, hand to, left to right or right to left. So the polarity of the initial, the initiation of packaging has been lost, suggesting that in the initiation, during initiation, there may be important recognition between the RNA and the end, the left end of the DNA that increases the probability of packaging the DNA always in the same direction. Thank you. So um, are you able to measure the efficiency of this motor? And then uh, follow up questions to that is, is it the same amounts of base uh, ATP is you hydrolyze in if you have like 60 atmosphere pressure or in the beginning, so. Uh. Yes, good question. Um, okay, so first of all, the efficiency of the, of the motor. We can measure the efficiency because we know the maximum force that the motor can generate, which is 60 piconewtons times 2.5 nanometers, is piconewtons nanometers, that's work. We can divide that by the energy of one ATP and that gives us an efficiency of approximately 64%. So it's a very high thermodynamic efficiency, which is not surprising. Most of these molecular motors are extremely efficient compared to the machines, the macroscopic machines that we can build in our daily lives. Um, with respect to the, the effect of the pressure, um, there is a very interesting phenomenon that is occurring. We are actually doing the experiments right now where as the pressure increases and they go to 10, 20, 30, 40 atmospheres, actually the burst size from 10 base, bur base bursts starts getting smaller. And we can see 9.5, 9, 9 8.5 towards 100% packaging. So we don't know what really is happening. We think that because it's a continuous decrease in the burst size, probably what is happening is that the deformation involved by the pressure actually is actually affecting the size of the power stroke that the end loops actually carry out for every uh, hydrolysis, uh, phosphate release. But we are not completely sure. But the fact is that the pressure does affect the mechanical performance towards the end of packaging. Yeah, great talk. And um, Thank you. I, I come from a totally different field, and I'm thinking more about a practical application. Are you working on DNA sequencing? Because it would be a fantastic and simple method to do long-run sequences without all the um, 
other effort. And an, another thing, instead of uh, using free sawing, can you punch a hole in the far shed by using a, a small laser? Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, well, first, um, the first part is, um, yeah, the idea has occurred to us because we work with translocal cases that actually some of these things can be used for sequencing, particularly the ones that have a hole in the head, the trepanated heads, you could pass pieces of DNA that are very, very long. The problem continues to be the question of how do you know, how do you interrogate the motor to tell you what is the precise sequence that is passing at that moment through the motor? Um, the, the motor technically doesn't need to tell you what goes through. You can detect it after it passes the motor because it's, it's, a, it's a double strand which passes. So if, if it's embedded in a membrane, you, you can technically use some, some, some um, electro correct. interference or something to detect it. Correct, correct. So in fact, what you're saying is that you could use a motor to try to actually uh, promote the displacement, the translocation of the DNA at a well-defined rate, which we can control by ATP, concentration, and you use some kind of external fluorescence or other methodology to actually read, instead of applying an electric field as it is right now, where the DNA passes very fast. Yes, this is perfectly uh, reasonable the scheme, and I don't think uh, anybody... See, the problem is that the guys who are working with motors, like myself, are so, you know, we, we, don't, we never do anything useful in life, whereas <laughs> the people that are trying to do useful things like yourself can, can I do not work that? with motors. Uh, actually, I, I heard a similar talk from you like two or three years ago at the nanotechnology meeting. And I said, I gave the same uh, and, 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 apology. And, and I had, I, I filed actually an invention report on, on the FASH packaging, which was denied because I'm not working on it. So. All right, very good. Well, so some progress is being made. We can even do something good and useful without wanting it to do it, you know, and willingly. All right, the second part of your question has to do with the uh, opening of a hole, not by thawing. Well, remember the diameter of the, 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 ra the, diameter of the head is 400 nanometers. So uh, to use a laser, the, the smallest spot that you can actually collimate a laser is, is limited by diffraction, by the finite wavelength of light, which is about 300 nanometers. So in fact, you would hit a bacteriophage with a beam of light that is almost 90% of the size of the head. So while it's possible that you could damage it in one way or another, I don't think it would be very controlled. Microcrystals of ice seem to be a better solution. And by adding some RNA, we, we can always uh, revive the, the damaged RNAs, right, uh, motors. So. I have a, a question as well. I find myself intrigued by that high pressure uh, DNA in the head. And having tried, for example, to push my grandkids jack in the box into the box, the hard part is not pushing it in, it's keeping it in when you're done. Yes. So what, do you know anything about the process for capping the mm -hmm. bacteriophage after yes. the DNA's in? Yeah, so no, that's a very good point. Um, in fact, the we don't know yet for a fact, but in fact, but um, we are about to do experiments using single molecule fluorescence, and we think that actually the connector, you, should, you remember the connector part, which is, looks like a, that has the opening of 36 nanometers in the middle, um, looks like a plug, literally, and when you look at the crystal structure, in fact, you see that it's made up of a bunch of alpha helices that are oriented, aligned in this inclined fashion, almost suggesting a um, diaphragm mechanism, like the diaphragm in the camera, where by twisting slightly the, the lower part of the connector relative to the higher part of the connector, you could actually close the, the opening, perhaps. And so we imagine, although this is, needs to be demonstrated yet, that it may work like, I don't know if you've seen this thing called Chinese finger trap, right? You, it's a little tube made out of uh, straw, right? And then you put one finger and the other finger and then you pull, and when you pull, the straw 
rotates and the diameter of the straw actually gets smaller and it traps your fingers and you cannot pull the fingers, right? I mean, Ting Ting Liu, who is also a postdoc in my lab, is shaking her head. She knows what the Chinese finger trap is. So maybe the DNA actually, we think that this collector may actually be functioning as a Chinese finger trap and by rotating it slightly actually closes the the opening and actually holds on to the pressure of the DNA. Well, thank you for a truly elegant presentation. And um, we're, we'll all look forward to the, the, uh, the following uh, details. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, There, there will be a reception in the library, and everyone is invited to chat a little more with Dr. Bustamante.